Thank you so much. So good to be with you. Why don't you give the band a hand? They've done a brilliant job this morning. So good. Oh, fantastic. Hey, grab a seat. Why don't you grab a seat? Last time I was with you, you were in a totally different building. I mean, my goodness, last time I was with you, everything was wooden. <laughs> like, you know, and not the people, just the building. Okay, just don't, don't say that personally to anyone, please. Um, and then, then suddenly, you know, I, I, I disappear. We have a small global pandemic and you're in here. Who knows what God can do when we're not locked down and limited? Like, think about it for a moment. If God can do this when all the limitations are in place and everything that humanity can do to slow down and hold back growth, what is God going to do when all the limitations are lifted? I mean, what is it going to be like when we're suddenly going, because we're sitting here right now and apart from a few smatterings of chairs, uh, we're putting out extra chairs this morning. Like, come on. I mean, this is not a, it's not an insignificant thing. It's not an insignificant moment. Extra chairs are exciting. Now, some ministers, let me tell you some pastoral secrets. Some ministers put out less chairs than they need so that they can get out extra chairs and tell people. True story. But we set out last night, I enjoyed it last, I had a great time last night after we finished our event and uh, the guys were resetting up and I, I love putting out chairs. I'm a pastor, I love putting out chairs because chairs means people and laying out chairs, there's a science to chairs, did you know that? Like there's a genuine science, how you lay them out, the angle that you get on the side so that you can look at me easily and not be looking over there or over there. And there's a, and there's a science to where you put the brakes and the rolls so that people feel comfortable and they feel close enough. And I'm watching this room and I'm thinking to myself, do you know what, it's probably not long till you're back at multiple services. I mean, why not? I'm sorry. I mean, why not? Like, why not? Get a sense in your heart, God, you can fill this room multiple times over and over on a Sunday because it's the heart of God. Lost people encountering the love of Jesus through his people and being transformed. That's what it's all about. It's such a privilege to be with you, Julie and I. I said to Julie about two weeks ago, I said, hey, I'm going to, going to Aberdeen to do this uh, AOG one day summit, stay it over. Do you want to come and meet Elizabeth? And she said, I'm coming, I'm coming for that. She wasn't too bothered about the event yesterday. She doesn't really care about me preaching, right? And, and I'm, I'm in minor trouble for that. But the thought of just hanging out with Ian and Elizabeth, we love your pastors. They are brilliant, brilliant leaders and wonderful people. Why don't you put your hands together for them? And let me tell you another secret. At this point, they hate this moment. And I have to tell you, our senior pastors hate this moment too, and we like to do it to them. Why don't you put your hands together for your pastors again? Because just, just to honour them and love them and show how much respect we have for them. Oh. So we're married, obviously. We've been married for 28 years this year. And uh, my wife likes me to say that when she's not travelling with me. It just keeps everybody away. And... Um, and, 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 and we have three children. Our eldest is 25. She's just got married. She got married two years ago, uh, two years ago last week. And then we have a 22-year-old and a 19-year-old. And um, if you ever see any AOG promo, uh, our son is in a lot of the promo. He's one of the drummers at Audacious Church. And he's one of our students at Missio Day. So you kind of, if you see this really curly-haired monster of a child, we're sorry. But when we get together as a family and everyone comes back, the focal point of our home is the dining table. It's that point where we gather everyone together because when we get to the dining table, you get the best moments in family life. You don't get the best moments in family life watching TV. You don't get the best moments in, in, in family life when everyone's gone to separate spaces. You get the best moments in family life when you gather around the table. And when we gather around the table, we tell the best stories, the best stories. In fact, we had to make a rule. We have one rule in our family table, no singing at the table. Now, the reason is, if the singing starts, 
it, it just gets a little bit wild. And we felt we had to tone it down. But you are allowed to tell stories. So just the other day, just this week, um, our, our, our middle child, Grace, is 22, and she's a trainee nurse at the moment. She's in the middle of a degree, becoming a nurse. And she's coming home on the bus from a placement. And she sat on the bus and she said, I'm sat on the bus and I keep hearing this noise, this I'm thinking, that's a strange noise on a bus. She's in this very strange. What is that noise on the bus? She says, and just, you know, she stretched and, and ran her hand down her hair and she went, My, tss, tss. She turned around. The elderly couple behind her are sanitizing her. They'd realised she was in a nurse's uniform <laughs> and was sanitising her on the bus. She goes, what are you doing? We're sanitising you, you're very dangerous. You could kill everyone on this bus. So she tells this story and we're all laughing. Our son is part-time job, he works in Aldi. And if you've ever, ever been to an Aldi? Yeah, you've been to an Aldi? And you know they have that packing area? Like just behind the tills, there's this packing area and there's a space behind the packing area. It's about, you know, that kind of wide. For those of you watching online, about that wide, right? And, um, and, and he said he was on the till and, you know, they're trained to go fast. They're not going fast for you, they're going fast for them. Because if they go too slow, they get penalised and sacked. So they're going fast for themselves. So he's training to go fast. And he's doing this thing and, and this dad, is, he's doing this, this dad's food. And the dad's got two kids and, and the dad suddenly goes, oh. And Ethan goes, what? He says, I think we've got a problem. So Ethan's thinking to himself, how have we got a problem? So he's thinking, he's got no money. He's forgotten his wallet. He says, have you forgotten your wallet? He says, no, no, no. He says, what's wrong? He said, I think my son's in trouble. So Ethan turns around and his four-year-old son has managed to put his head up through the gap between the window and the packing area. And then he's turned his head around. So he's, the packing area is under here and the window's against the back of his head. So Ethan says, well, you never get so, so what, I did, what did you do, Ethan? He says, well, my manager, because they're all talking on the comms, they talk about us. Customers, they talk about us. Have oh, you seen that guy in aisle two? Yeah, watch him. Oof. You know, oh, lady, lady coming in again. We all know she tries to steal a steak every time. Just keep your eye on her. So they talk about us. So all his colleagues are going, Ethan, what are you going to do? So he's like, I'm on two. What am I going to do? So he says to the guy, what are you going to do? He says, I don't know what to do. So Ethan, one of his colleagues says, Ethan, you're a youth leader in church. <laughs> like that has anything to do with getting a child's head out of a tight space. It's your, you, think, you go and sort it out. So, you know, he signs off his tail and he says, okay, we're going to search. So they go, and you know, he says, maybe if we push him up. So they try pushing him up. He says, maybe if we push him up. No, no, no. So the dad says, have, have you got any soap? <laughs> so it's Aldi. <laughs> have you got any soap? Yeah, we've got an aisle of it. You know, what flavor do you want? <laughs> so they go and the dad pours and chooses strawberry. So he walks back to the sun with this, this, this shower gel it was. And he says, I'm just gonna, just gonna put a little bit on you know, the side of his neck just to lubricate him to go down. So the dad though, just blasts him with the shower gel and the little boy opens his mouth. <laughs> Cause he's heard the word strawberry. So all this shower gel is gone and he's absolute, it's an utter mess. He's just, and so Ethan says he didn't. So then we had to get a bottle of water and pour it over the boy. Now the soap is sudding. He said, eventually, he said, he pushed down, the dad pulled down and the little boy eventually popped out. Took him 45 minutes. I said, why don't you call the fire brigade? We have the best stories around the dinner. We have the best conversations around the dinner table where a story suddenly turns serious. And somebody opens up and shares their heart. And the cha we went out for a meal last night and there's just a beautiful moment as we were sat eating uh, with another of a national leadership team from AOG. And there's just this moment where we felt we just, we're just gonna pray right now. The table matters. And what I wanna talk to you about this morning, I wanna talk to you about the King's Church table. Because what we do when we gather whether it's a Sunday like this or it's a Monday night to pray, whether it's in the coffee shop or it's in one of the three billion rooms you have. 
What actually happens is we set a table and we invite people to join us. We invite them to come and sit alongside us for an encounter that transforms lives. That's what we do. What does the King's Church table look like? If you've got your Bibles, I truly hope you have. Why don't you turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 9. If you're going electronic, that's absolutely fine. There is a verse somewhere that talks about the need to read a paper Bible, else you're not probably going to heaven. 2 Samuel chapter 9. Pastor, what do you mean amen? You had your, you had your iPhone out here. Amen, you've got your real Bible now, I know. Did you know why that is? Because he couldn't zoom in to be able to see it when he was up here. 2 Samuel chapter 9. There must be a clock somewhere, but I'm ignoring it. 2 Samuel chapter 9 goes like this. It's the story of David and Mephibosheth. If you know your Bible, you know the story, but it's a beautiful story. David is king. David's become king when Saul, the previous king, and his son Jonathan have died in battle. And because they were afraid of what might happen to the grandson, Mephibosheth, they rushed him out of the palace. And in the rush to get him out of the palace, he was dropped on the floor. And as a small child, his ankles or lower legs were broken. And he never recovered from it. David established as king, says this, Is there anyone still left in the house of Saul, verse 1, to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? And a servant from the household named Ziba came and they summoned him and he said, Are you Ziba? He said, At your service, my king. The king said, Is there no one alive to whom I can show kindness? And Ziba said, There's a son of Jonathan. He's lame in both legs. Just for a moment. Imagine that the only description of you is the very thing that feels like the brokenness of you. He's not even named him. The grandson of a king. And he can't even bother to find his name in his memory. He describes his infirmity. Where is he? David asked and Ziba said, he's in the house of Machia, son of Amiel in Lodabar. He's not even in his own home. Imagine going from a palace to being a refugee. Lord Debar, the name literally meaning without pasture, a barren place. From a palace to a place of lack. So David had him brought from the place of lack, from the house of Machia, son of Amiel. And when Mephibosheth son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David. He bowed down. And David said, Mephibosheth. Do you know the first thing that happens when you come to the king's church table? You are seen as you. David didn't say, so, Explain to me, are you, are you Jonathan's son, right? You're Saul's grandson. I, I know it's you because of the infirmity. He called him by name. Mephibosheth. The king's church table is a table that welcomes you by name. There is a seat saved for you. There is a place setting with your name on it in this house. If you're visiting today, can I say to you, as a visitor myself, there is a seat saved for you here. That people have prayed over you before you even knew you were coming here. They have set a space for you. Why did the church buy a building like this? Because there is more space in it. And the space is not for program, it's for people. Because the space allows us to go, how many more people can we get round the table that is King's Church? There's a space for you. At your service, he replied, and don't be afraid, David said. I will show you kindness 
for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I'll restore to you everything that belonged to your grandfather and you will always eat at my table. We'll come back to it. Mephibosheth bowed down. And what is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? And then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's steward, and said, I've given him everything. You and your sons are servants. Farm the land for him. Bring in the crops. Everything is be provided for him. But Mephibosheth will always eat at my table. Ziba said, we'll do whatever you ask. And then verse 11, so Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth, verse 13, lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table. Oh, by the way, (laughs) he was lame. It's like the Bible reverses the world's view. Let me tell you where he is. Let me tell you where he is. Let me tell you where he's found himself positioned. Let me tell you everything that's been given to him and everything that's been provided for him. Oh, by the way, (laughs) that thing you tried to define him with doesn't even matter anymore. I love the start of this narrative. David asked this question. Is there anyone left in the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? What is the king's church table? It is a table that demonstrates the love and kindness of God. That looks for people to show kindness to. That makes an active choice To not just look to one another. Isn't it great who we've got around the table? It's just lovely to have us together. But actually stops and puts his head up and says, who else in our city? Who else in our county? Who who else in those outlying towns and villages could we show kindness to? Who's out there that we could reach out to And we could draw them to come and sit at the table with us. Actually, we're not just inviting them to sit at the table. We're inviting them to be part of the family. Who is it that we can draw in? The King's Church table is a table built around love. 1 Corinthians 14 tells us to follow the way of love. The message translates it like this. Go after the life of love as if your life depended on it. A passionate desire to love people. Part of my role in the life of our church and in the life of our movement is to work with government. I have to get dressed a little bit differently to do it, but it's okay. I look pretty good in a suit. I have to do my hair. But we petition government for the sake of refugees to change the rules and change the law because we recognise that there's a space and a place for everyone. And for those with the least, those who have, of us who have much, much is asked of us. So we find ourselves in a country now that welcomes refugees, that opens the door, whether they be Syrian or Afghanistan. Because suddenly we're going, let's be who we're called to be. When you live in a life of love, it doesn't matter if you know them, you can still love them. You don't have to wait till they become your friend. We've got to reach out in love to show love by the God of love in our hearts. We demonstrate God's love. Mephibosheth became David's family based on a promise. Like our table, right? My wife was not born a Kia, which is a good thing now, because that would have been odd. 
and potentially illegal. She's born a Collins. But when we sit around the Kia table, because of a promise we made to one another, the table and the name are as much hers as they are mine. We don't go, well, you know, Julie, you've not been a Kia all your life. I mean, the kids have, but you haven't. I mean, for a while, you were a Collins, do you know? And you have no Scottish ancestry, unlike me. (laughs) We don't differentiate like that because we made a promise to one another that meant we became one. So we can't go, well, this bit was me and this bit was you. No, no, that's, that's who we are. And the kids are an outworking of that promise. Now, when we make that level of promise like David made to Jonathan, I'm going to include you family. Your family will always be my family. They'll always be a part of what I do. We have to understand the power of covenant promise that it breaks through every barrier that the world can throw at every situation. It breaks through every falling out, every disagreement. Covenant promise breaks through all of those things. And we are called to go into all the world to fulfill God's covenant promise to the world that is in John 3.16. That he he sent his son, why? So the world could all know him. And our responsibility is to outwork that and to go and deliver it and to create a table where promises are fulfilled. A table where people are brought out of love into promise. There's so much more for you as a local church. So much more. Nobody wants a building to be the pinnacle of a church's life. Nobody wants extra rooms to be the pinnacle. It's the growth of people. That as we see more and more people finding him, it changes their life. It was based on a promise. But what else does King's Church Table look like? You stop for a moment and pause with me to think who's round the table. David's table. And you've got David. King David. David. The Bible starts off by describing him as a handsome young man. He becomes this warrior king. He's been, he, he has been there and done that. He has worshipped passionately. He's a singer, songwriter. He's a fighter. He is, he is everyone's dream ball, right? He really is. And David is sat at the table. It's probably a harp in the corner. You know, every now and again, he just, just sort of, you know, wanders from the table, writes another psalm sits down again, you know. It must be like living with Simon. (laughs) You know, the blue eyes twinkle, the guitar just, I've just written another song, love. They'll be singing it around the world. I don't know him well enough to do this, but I'm okay. Um, (laughs) David's at the table. Right? Who else? David's table. Joab, the commander of the army, this gruff general. You know, knives in places that should never be there. And the sword, and he walks in and slams down the armour, sits at the table and you just think to yourself, let him choose first. You know, if it's a buffet, he's going before me. He looks like he needs, you know, half a cow just to keep him happy. He's probably Scottish, right? So he's there, Joab like, you know, he's in there. And then they start to drift in, the kids of David, Absalom ridiculously handsome, flowing locks like mine, just walks in and, and you know, like, man alive. And Tamar, David's beautiful princess daughter. And Solomon wanders in. Like, you know, hey, I've just solved a few equations. <laughs> just coming in and, you know, I was thinking as I was coming in, I think I know how to classify all the chemicals in the world now. Just a thought. Sits down at the table. And Mephibosheth. If I had to identify with one of them, I'm not David. I don't feel like the king with all the gifts and the victories. 
I don't feel like the handsome prince who walks in with so much charisma, he's going to turn the country against his father. I, I don't feel like the wisdom of Solomon. I feel like Mephibosheth. I feel like I drag myself down the corridor and I just about make it. And I get to the table with all of my stuff. Does anybody else have stuff? You, know, you don't want to say the stuff, but you've got stuff. And Mephibosheth has dragged him with his stuff into the room. In a few chapters time, Absalom is going to rebel. And Mephibosheth gets left behind because he can't even get himself out of the palace. But he gets himself to the table with all of his brokenness. I don't know what your brokenness looks like. Probably like me, it's not an obvious thing. We're not a Mephibosheth with our legs potentially in splints and, and hobbling through life. Except the stuff is hidden by a smile. How are you doing? I'm doing great. You had a great oh, I've had a great week. Everything, everything's going so well. It's just been brilliant. No, no, honestly, it's been brilliant. You spent most of the week wrapped up inside yourself. You got your stuff. Can we tell you a secret? We've all got our stuff. Time's going. Mephibosheth gets to the table. And as he reclines at the table, he becomes just the same as everybody else. Oh, it's not about how far you can walk or whether you can fight or whether you can write a psalm. It's not about how charismatic you are as a leader or the wisdom that you display. It's that you're at the table. It's that you've got a place at the table. You have a place at the table. You have a space at King's Church table that the king has set for you. It is amazing in that passage we read that literally four times in 13 verses, it says, always eat at the king's table. Always eat at the king's table. Why? Because we live in a world that's trying to get us to eat at a different king's table. That the table of this world is trying to get you to think a different way. It's trying to get you to act a different way. And it's trying to get you to believe other things than what the king's table is getting you to believe. About who you are and what you're about. About your purpose on the planet. About how you find your identity in who you are as a person. It's trying to get you to think differently about it. And we've got to make a decision. God, I am always going to eat at the king's table. I am not going to be distracted by these other tables that tell me there's a quicker way, an easier way, that tell me there's a way to get through this without even trying, that tell me there's a way that education makes the only thing you need. It's something you need, not the only thing you need that tells you where your identity should be from. Don't let some archaic book decide who you are. Actually, it's not the archaicness of the book. It's the writer of the book who can't be archaic because he designed time, he's outside of time, and he's working through time to bring about his working. It's just that he was speaking into the future when he wrote in the past. It's shaping, it's moving, it's making us mobile in a way that we can never make ourselves mobile. I'm a lad from Bolton, just north of Manchester. My dad and my granddad worked in the same factory. And I find myself in palaces with kings and I literally think to myself, how on earth did I, I haven't even got a degree. I haven't even got a degree. I went to Bible college, they didn't even do degrees when I went to Bible college. 
I got a certificate from the college, like that they printed. Like, you know, there's no, no one sat around and went, this, oh, this is definitely worth it. Somebody just went, yeah, let's give him a certificate. The lad did well. And I got a certificate. I won't even put it up in my office. I'd be embarrassed by it. But we find ourselves with any of those things because we sat at the king's table. Do you know what? Sitting at the king's table is the fastest way to accelerate your life to everything God wants you to do. Daniel finds himself a refugee and a prisoner in a foreign land. It tells in Daniel chapter one that the king wanted to train them, but in order to train them, what he did was he sent the best food from where? From that king's table. Fine wines, rich meats, thick sauces, wonderful food. And Daniel and his three friends, out of every Jewish boy who'd been taken there, four of them made this decision, we ain't gonna eat from that king's table. Because if I eat from that king's table, who I am is corrupted. He's not not eating it because he doesn't fancy that kind of food and he's decided he wants to be vegan this week. He's not eating it because he understands that what goes into him is about who he actually is. He is holding to his conviction in the midst of a culture that is desperately trying to change him to fit into their culture. And so Daniel, with this king's table in front of him, decides to stay at the king's table. He acknowledges they're gonna change my name. They're gonna call me Belteshazzar. I, I, got, they, I gotta wear different robes, but these are all external things to me. Because on the inside, I am holding to the truths and the beliefs. I am holding on that I was called to the King's table to be a King's man and to live passionately for Him. I am not letting that change. And then he says this, test us. I love the power of that. That we can go, God, with all of my stuff, you put me at the table and you cover me over. And we get tested. The table's made of wood. Every time we talk in the Bible about something crafted from a tree, there is a tree that we consider. As the table covers the legs of Mephibosheth, so the cross covers our lives. When Daniel makes the statement, test us, it's not their resolve not to eat meat that's being tested. It's God's ability to carry His children through a time of trial. Test us. You see, we're not being tested. God's faithfulness is being tested. And as we set the table today, a table of love, a table of promise, and a table of inclusion, we can say, test us. Lord, would you test us as King's Church? Test us with people that you bring in for us to care for. Test us with programs that you give us to serve the city, the least the lost and the lonely. Test us with those so close to your heart that you would hand them to us. But we have got to bring ourselves to the King's table. So this is what I would like to do. I have, no one explained the different colours on the clock to me. So I'm seeing three different sets of numbers and I'm going to take the longest one. Right. Test us. This is what I'd like to do. You've got stuff. I've got stuff. Can we stop letting our stuff excuse our service? I have lots of great reasons why I'm not a good choice for the general manager of Assemblies of God. I have lots of great reasons 
why I'm not a good choice to be an associate pastor of a multi-site, multi-thousand church. I have lots of great reasons. But God just keeps letting me do it. Because I keep bringing my stuff and tucking it under the table of the cross and just going, okay, God, well, you know and I know. And I've told my friends who are my close companions and those who mentor me, I've gone, I've got this stuff. And they go, okay, let's take it to the cross. Let's tuck it back under the table. We're not hiding the stuff. We're just saying the stuff doesn't stop you. So this morning, we're gonna open the altar. There's plenty of space right across the front, side to side, because you got stuff. And you have made the decision that the stuff stops you serving. What if today you could come to the table, put it under the table, and you could sit with kings and princes, with warriors and generals, with artists and artisans, and realize this seat suits me. This seat is for me because my Father chose me to be here. Why don't you stand to your feet all across the room? We're gonna sing in a moment, but before we sing, I'm just gonna open this space and say to you, hey, why don't you come to the table? Slide out of your seat and just say, Lord, may there be nothing of me that stops me serving you. Let me passionately play my part in the King's Church table. So before the band play, because that would make it easy, right? Before we sing, that would make it easy. Why don't you do that now? Come now. It's not a salvation moment. It's a surrender moment. It's a surrender of your plans. It's a surrender of your stuff. It's a surrender of your moments. I don't know how many times I've had to come back to God and go, God, I'm just surrendering again. I I am just surrendering again. Because as we build the table, there's space for everyone. Maybe you want to come as a family and say, God, We're bringing our table to your table. We're putting our family table under your table. We recognise that you cover us. Just gonna give you a few more moments. Just believe there's something transactional about to happen as we put our stuff and go, God, you can use me. Lord, would you use me? I wish I could have been a bit more rah, rah, rah. But I know what I needed to bring. I'm hanging in because the worst thing that ever happens is having to confess you've got stuff. So I'm going to hang in for another minute. Some of you are thinking, just get me through this next minute. Well, you can. But come on. What if you didn't have to? slide past the person next to you just wander down no one's going to ask you hey what's your stuff this is between you and God wandering down I just want to give them the time just to do that
Father, for every single person, whether they've slid to the front or stayed in their seat, Lord, we thank You that the action of just saying, God, would You move in me? Would You take my life as I present it back to You to be a, 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 a vessel for You to use to transform my world? Father, we speak over this house. Let this be this wonderful table that people are brought to, that people encounter, whose lives are transformed. We pray for story after story around the table of King's Church that brings joy to You, God. We pray stories about families transformed. We pray stories about communities transformed. Lord, we pray laughter moments and moments where our hearts break as we see and hear and feel all that is happening. Father, we speak over this family, over this table. May it bring life and health to this city, to this nation and to the nations of the world, we pray in Jesus' Name. Amen.